Hi guys, thank you for joining us today. I'm uh, Harshita Bhatt. I'm a board certified behavior analyst. And uh, today we are just going to talk about how we can incorporate uh, some simple techniques using the ABA VB therapy at home with our kids. Right, so of course this is um, a difficult time for all of us where we have limited access to resources. Uh, but we have to keep in mind uh, that even though uh, the situation is happening, uh, we can find ways how we can continue to work on some of the skills with our kids at home, right? So today we are just going to give you some tips and some activities and some strategies on how uh, you can use, uh, you know, some simple uh, things to work at home with your kids. So learning doesn't really have to happen on a table and chair, right? Learning can happen anywhere. And it's even better if it happens in a natural environment, right? You want your kids to be able to adapt to various environments, to be able to generalize that knowledge across uh, various settings, wherever they go, right? So uh, today we'll talk about how we can sort of in a very natural way uh, teach our kids at home. Um, in the comfort and safety, of course, uh, going by the current situation and the comfort and safety of our home, right? So since uh, parents and caregivers, they are the ones who uh, actually spend the maximum time at home with the kids. Uh, even when the kids go for therapy, uh, that happens for a while, right? But the kids do go back home and the parents and the caregivers, they should also be equipped with the skills on uh, how to deal with the child, how to work with their child, how to give certain simple instructions and how to make their kids follow, right? So working with kids at home, uh, it might seem a little daunting. It might seem uh, that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a technical skill that not everybody has, uh, but it is something which can be done. We can work on very, very simple uh, skills. We can incorporate a lot of things into our very simple routines that we are doing at home these days. And uh, this actually uh, helps with the continuity, right? It keeps the flow going. Uh, the kids, uh, they learn something somewhere maybe at our center. And of course, they are able to practice that at home as well. So it, it leads to generalization of skills. Uh, so today, uh, me and uh, two of my other colleagues, Belle and Sharon, would also be joining us um, in this webinar to tell us more about what we are going to learn today. Okay, uh, so some of the things that we're going to talk about today is how we can set up some simple routines uh, for our kids at home. Uh, what are some of the simple activities uh, that we can try with our kids at home to teach them the skills? And then, of course, we'll go into some tips in teaching your child at home. Uh, so, guys, here I would just like to say that uh, please keep your questions coming. We'll be very, very happy to entertain and answer all your questions. But we'll be doing it at the end so that, you know, we keep the flow of the talk and uh, the things that we're going to talk about going. So please keep sending in your questions and we will be having ample time to discuss all of those things at the end. Okay, so this is something as I already mentioned, right? Like um, during this time of the circuit breaker, a lot of the families, they've not been able to come to the center because of obvious reasons for their kids' therapy sessions. Uh, so, as an organization, uh, ARN has been doing its best. We've been trying our best to help the parents and the caregivers and give them as much assistance as possible so that they can uh, continue with the child's therapy at home in this time of crisis, right? Okay, this is again something uh, already been mentioned. Uh, during these challenging times, it's very critical that our kids still get practice with the skills, right? Why is that? That's simply because if we have a time gap between, uh, you know, the kids uh, learning and now that they are not getting access to these uh, uh, skills again uh, for some time, it might, it might lead uh, to the kids regressing. So uh, by regressing, I mean they might lose out on some of the skills that they've already learned, right? They might fall back again and we might have to really start all over again right moreover 
this is actually a very very good time to practice these skills at home it tells us whether the, these kids have actually been able to learn those skills to a point where they can be applied to another setting that is home can it be applied uh, across other people so i so if they are able uh, to display those skills with their teachers are they also able to display those skills with the parents with their peers uh, with uh, their siblings right so these uh, are things that we can actually see during these times uh, so some components of effective therapy that I feel, uh, I feel is, of course, one being consistency, which is actually the continued practice of skills, which is why we are here today, right? So that even if uh, we are not able to go to uh, the center, we can still continue to practice these skills in the safety and comfort of our homes. Then, of course, we can talk about generalization. So generalization being a very, very important skill. So if a kid has actually learned a skill and mastered, its real test is whether he can actually apply that skill uh, across other people. As I mentioned, is he do he's doing it with me. Is he able to do it with the parents, with other people across time? So he's doing it today. Is he also able to do it tomorrow or maybe day after, three months from now, one year from now? Uh, also across different settings. So he's being able to do it uh, at the center, but how about at home or anywhere else you go, right? So this is basically generalization. Then we talk about maintenance, which is basically, uh, is the child able to retain the skill over a period of time? Okay, so uh, these are some of the ways in uh, which uh, Autism Recovery Network has uh, been helping out the parents and the ca caregivers during this time. Uh, so first of all, uh, ARN has been doing online sessions with its clients so that, chills, uh, the, so that the children are getting continued practice with the skills and uh, they don't lose out any skills over this period of time. Uh, so since we are doing these online sessions, uh, the parents and caregivers can actually participate fully. They can, um, uh, they can talk to us about the issues that they are facing at home with the child, some skills that they would like their child to learn at home. At the same time, we can also, as uh, therapists and supervisors, we are able to observe the parents working with their child while giving them tips. And also then we can give them feedback on how to do things better. So it's, a very, it's very much a collaborative effort actually right now going on with the therapists, the parents, the caregivers, all working together to achieve the same goal, which is basically the development of our children, right? Uh, then of course, uh, based on each child's needs, uh, their deficits, what they need to work on, we also create customized home programs for uh, the children and we share those with the parents so that they can implement those things at home with their children. Okay, uh, so the first thing that we are going to talk about is what are the simple ways that, you know, we can set up some routines at home these days. We are, since our kids and us, we are spending the maximum time at home these days. So what are the ways we can set up some routines, uh, get, the, uh, get the kids in a flow of routine and in the process also teach them uh, some important skills. Okay, so uh, routines actually can be set up very simply. They just provide structure, they provide some predictability. So as we know, our kids with autism or uh, developmental delays, they really thrive on predictability, they thrive on structure, right? So what routines actually do is they give them that structure, right? So that, you know, they are less anxious of what is going to come and they are more prepared uh, as to how to deal with the situations that are going to come up. Right. So as I just mentioned, setting up routines will help your child adjust and cope with the changes in their daily lives. OK, so these are some of the sample routines, uh, just very some simple examples uh, that we can actually incorporate. So when we wake up in the morning, you can work on uh, the child uh, saying good morning. So uh, this is actually a step where you can actually break it down. You can start with uh, responding to good morning. So you might say it to them and they say it back to you. Once you see that the kid is now responding to your good morning, 
you can then move it to initiating where the child uh, initiates good morning and then gets responses from others right so um, another thing i would like to uh, bring up here is guys uh, sometimes we see that the kids uh, we work on a lot of responses from our kids right so we say a lot of things and we get back from them right at some point of time we also have to see where we start working on the initiation how where the kid is taking charge and he is coming up with something so how is he initiating the good morning or how is he initiating various tasks okay uh, another thing is making the bed so as simple as that right so here is something where you can work on the identification of the bed the pillow the blanket um, so he can identify you can ask him okay uh, okay so this is the bedroom so where's the bed so the child can point to the bed okay where's the pillow the child can point to the pillow where's the blanket the child can point to the blanket so this is how he's getting his vocabulary he's learning right then of course uh, once he's able to point as in how the child is you can work on labeling so what's this okay this is the bed this is the blanket this is the pillow right so also once they have they've probably so since this is just a simple example once they've master some of these basic uh, things that they see like the bed pillow blanket you can move to probably other things that they see around the bedroom say the lamp or the door or the cupboards things like that then bath time right so bath time can also be a good time to teach some skills to your kids right so this can here you can work on things like naming the body parts suppose the kid is uh, 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 needs to rub soap on his body right so you can actually do it in that way okay uh, let's rub a soap on the nose so the child can actually start rubbing the soap on the nose okay let's rub soap on the neck so this is where you can incorporate learning some of the body parts right then dressing up that's another time where you can actually teach some skills so here uh, you can do some simple instruction following right you can keep some things around the room and you can give simple instructions to the child okay get the shirt once the child gets the shirt, okay, get the pants, get the underwear, right? Also identification, okay, point to the shirt, show me the underwear, where's the pants, all of these things. So simple identification of uh, clothing. Uh, then comes mealtime, right? So mealtime is also another good time to teach your uh, kids some uh, meal skills, right? So th things like starting from requesting for food, right? So uh, let, let them ask you when they are feeling hungry, right? So sometimes when we provide everything to the kids, they don't really have the opportunity to request for anything, right? So you can do it actually in a very simple way also. Suppose it's time for breakfast. So you just give maybe the bowl and the cereal. Let them ask you for the spoon. Or you give them the spoon and the cereal and let them ask you for the bowl, things like that. Mm. Okay, so here we are just going to watch a very simple video of uh, a therapist working on the hand washing skill. And then, hold on one second, just going to play the video. Okay, so it's like this put it here and then here, here. Okay, okay, your turn. So here you just saw how uh, the teacher worked on uh, the child setting the table right for his meal. Okay, now let's watch another video of uh, washing hands. Okay, Jay, so you open the faucet first. Okay. Open. Kevin. Good job, Jay. Okay, wash hands properly. Rinse properly. Okay. Done. Okay, then dry your hands with towel.
Okay. Okay, already? Okay, so here we basically saw uh, the therapist working with the child on some very, very simple skills like washing hands and setting the table. So this is something you could also work at home with your own kid, right? So uh, whenever it's time for, uh, for lunch or any sort of meal, let them uh, uh, set the table. Right. So this is also a good time to identify some of the things like the cup, the bowl, the table mat, the fork, the spoon. So these are things you can work on as well. And also you just give probably a simple instruction like set your table. And then uh, one by one, they are supposed to get all the things and they're supposed to set their table and then they can have their meal. In the second video, which uh, talks about uh, basically the hand washing routine. So this is also... So when we think of hand washing, right, for us, it comes very naturally. We just go wash our hands, right? For some of our kids, we might have to break down the steps, right, into simpler units, which they can learn very, very simply, right? So the first step being, okay, you just open the tap, then you get the soap, then you rub your hands uh, with the soap, you rinse, you close the tap, and then you probably wipe your hands on the towel, right? Okay, uh, so when we talk about routines, visual schedule is a very, very helpful uh, technique how uh, we can teach some routines to us kids, right? So visual schedule represents a schedule of tasks and activities. So it, as I mentioned, it just breaks down the complete task into simpler teachable steps, right? So something like washing hands or brushing teeth or washing face or dressing. So all of these skills uh, might be broken down into simpler teachable steps and then we train on each step at one time so that the kids are then able to acquire them as a whole, right? So it can be something, uh, I'll just move to the next screen so you guys can see, something like this, right? Uh, so whenever a child, so this is like a morning get up routine okay so the, so what is the child supposed to do you can use pictures uh, if the child is a visual learner if the child can read you can uh, use printed words right so you can just have a routine where the child will just look at the schedule for the day okay uh, before bed what do i have to do and it's shower time then i put on my pajamas then it's quiet time then i need to brush my teeth then it's story time and then it's bedtime so this basically gives the child some idea about what is going to happen next. So they are better prepared, right? Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, so this was something, this was a schedule which, is, which tells the child what they are supposed to do right before bed, right? So even things, uh, simple activities like toothbrushing, face washing, hand washing, dressing, even those can be broken down into simpler steps and taught. Uh, so what are the benefits of using a visual schedule, right? So it ensures that the child follows the routine set by the parents or caregivers at home. So some of our kids, they are visual learners. Uh, when we probably just tell them what to do, they might not be able to make that connection or understand, or they might not be very clear with the expectations. But when we have it visually laid out in front of them, it gives them a clearer picture of what is going to come up and what are the expectations. Uh, it also increases flexibility and understanding of the visual stimulus presented in a sequence, right? So when, once I see it, I'll be able to understand much better. It's as simple as that. If they can see what they need to do, they'll be able to follow it much, much better. Uh, it helps the child to remain calm, avoiding unnecessary behaviors to occur, right? So when things are a little predictable for me, when I know what is going to come next, uh, I'll be less anxious and of course, I'll be less likely to engage in behaviors, unnecessary behaviors. Yeah. All right. So now, uh, Belle will actually talk about some activities that you guys can do at home with your kids, which in incorporate all of these skills. All right, so hi. Um, so uh, for now, we're going to talk about what other activities we can actually do at home. Because usually it's quite uh, difficult, you know, for parents or caregivers to think of what activities we can do. Um, especially now that uh, most of our kids are staying at home, there's no school, you know. So what are the things that we can actually do? 
So these are some of the activities that we can try doing, you know, with our kids. It doesn't really require um, any other, you know, materials that we can actually use, okay? It only requires like very simple uh, materials or very simple um, objects that are actually usually find at home, okay? So for the list of activities that we can do, uh, we can take a look at uh, some of the games that most of the kids would actually love to play with and most of the games that, you know, we can easily like do with our kids. Okay, so these are some of those activities. So one activity that we can actually do will be like a treasure hunt, okay? So treasure hunt is very famous activity when it comes to working with uh, uh, kids who like to look for things, who's also like engaged into like some sort of um, like uh, something that interests them and something like more of what can they actually do? What can they find? Okay, so th in, in this activity, you can use whatever materials, whatever objects, you have at home. It doesn't have to be like some of the session materials, you know, that we are using, but it's more of any item which are present in the environment. Okay. Now, when we actually teach this, we are teaching the kids how to follow instructions. And at the same time, they will be paying attention to what the game is all about. Now, there are also some things we're in you can also do it in different ways. Like if you're doing a treasure hunt, what you can actually do is maybe like get a box, put the items there, or maybe you can hide other things in different areas or you can do it per area, depending on the level of your child. If you think that doing it, you know, using the whole house will be somehow much more difficult for your child, then you can start maybe with putting items in just one box, okay? Or maybe putting it in just in the bedroom or in the living room, okay? So you have to also lessen the distractions depending on what your child actually wants to do. So let's say, for example, what you can do is, if, you, if your child wants this particular toy, then you can use it. Oh, let's say, let's go find the blocks. So in that way also, it's not going to be just immediately given to them, okay? You can also do it in a book wherein you can ask the child, to find a specific item based on whatever pictures they can see in the book. You can, see a very, you can use a very simple book initially so that at least it's easier to find. You can also use books with bigger pictures first. But then if you have a kid who's somehow very good at you know, uh, identifying, looking for the pictures, can name some items there, can name some pictures, then you can use a much more complex book for that or the books with more pictures okay then the next activity that we can do another activity for you know uh, play or games that we can do would be Simon Says so Simon Says is actually a game wherein the child would actually learn how to again listen follow instructions, and at the same time, it would also work on body awareness, and at the same time, it also works on other concepts such as numbers and colors, okay? That's something that we can actually do with the kids. So if we are teaching kids uh, to learn numbers, colors, letters, then we can do Simon Says, okay? Now, how do we do the activity of doing the Simon Says, okay? When we have this activity, usually you need to have the child learn how to follow basic instructions first. So basic instructions means you can start with asking the child to clap their hands, touch their nose, which are most commonly done in a way wherein when you sit with a child or the therapist sit with a child in a one-to-one -one setting, the therapist will ask these questions. But since we are actually incorporating this at home, you yourself can actually do it. You, the, mo the mom can do it, the dad can do it, the helpers can do it also because this is 
very simple. All you have to do is you have to know exactly what the child can do. Because the idea for doing the Simon says the child should be able to know or to do whatever you're asking them. So if let's say you want to incorporate numbers, so you can ask the child clap three times or jump three times, or you can say like, give me the, uh, find the item that is green, or touch your head, or, you know, something like, oh, Simon says, go to mommy, or go to daddy, or Simon says, give the spoon to mommy. So you can incorporate all those following instructions. In a way, it's very natural as well. For the child, for you, it doesn't have to be like, because some parents would say like, oh, I don't know how to do it with my child. Okay, I'm not a therapist myself. Yes, you are not, but we can always like teach you and assist you on how you can actually do it. We are doing it in a way that it's much more structured, but we also make sure that parents will follow up on all this. And parents would be able to actually do it with their kids also. Plus, at the same time, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun for the kid. It's going to be a learning experience for your child also. All right? Okay, the other activity that we can do is obstacle course. Now, for obstacle courses, usually we want to work on the coordination, body coordination, muscle strength, balance as well. Okay, that's something that we actually um, teach the child when it comes to uh, preparing whatever obstacle course we can do. Okay? Now, you can create your obstacle course inside your house. But in obstacle courses, you can just simply use your dining area, your living room area. If you have other toys there, like if you have um, like maybe a trampoline there, you can include it as well. If you have like somehow like pillows, you can put it there. If you have mats, you know, those exercise mats, you can actually put it as well. So very simple wherein the child would follow, you know, the simple steps so that they would actually do it in a way wherein, oh, first you have to crawl under the table and then you need to go up on the uh, sofa and then, you know, cross or, or step up on the chair or let's say you can actually like, uh, uh, let's say jump on the mat, you know, three times and then crawl under, you know, things like that. This is also where you can incorporate some activities, meaning, let's say, for example, your child is good with puzzles because sometimes the child would not know. So how many times do I need to do it? How many times do I need to do the, the obstacle course? Do I need to do it like five times, three times, you know? But you can also use those puzzles. So if, let's say, you have puzzles, five-piece puzzles, so that means like the child would need to do it like five times. Once the puzzle is finished, that means this activity is finished also, all right? Now, another activity which is very, very um, common, okay, in uh, schools, parties also, birthday parties where our kids would actually go is musical chairs, okay? Now, this is very famous because, you know, in every game, every part, birthday party, there will be like musical chairs. So when you do the musical chairs, it's as simple as, you know, you just get like a few chairs, you know, from the dining area or whatever chairs you have. If you have stools, you can do that also. So this can also be used to follow instruction. I mean, for the child to learn how to follow instructions, do um, when, they, when they need to be listening, if let's say you play the music, they need to know that oh, I need to follow the rules because each of the games, it has rules. So the rules for this would be you have to listen to the music. When the music stops, you have to sit down. When the music is playing, you need to go around the chairs when it stops at the time that you only sit down. So it works for kids where in, you know, you can improve the listening skills. You can also um, teach them how to be a bit more, you know, competitive when it comes to, you know, playing. You can play with them. If they have siblings, you, they can actually join. If you have like helpers, you know, staying with you at home, you can actually do it. It doesn't mean that musical chairs will only be done, you know, for kids because some parents might ask like, oh, I only have, uh, I only have 
um, one child at home. There's only one. So there's no like sibling, there's no playmate. The playmate cannot come to the house because of the circuit breaker. So what you can do is, you know, the mom, the dad, the brother or the sister, even the helper, you can actually set it up, okay? Because this one, most of the kids, they get the, you know, like the rush, the adrenaline rush that, okay, when the music stops, I need to sit down, okay? And you can also do it in a way that, oh, whoever actually wins this will have the particular snack. So you can use it as a reward also, so that at least they will be looking forward to it. It's a game, it's fun, but you can also incorporate giving them something so that they will be looking uh, or, or looking forward to it. They will be working on it first, all right? Okay, then another activity that we can actually uh, do at home is finding missing items, okay? When we say finding missing items, it's more of like, um, so it's it, is it somehow similar to doing a treasure hunt, okay? But the difference is with this one, you're going to give the child one or two of the items and then he needs to look for what else he needs to complete that activity. Okay? So in this aspect, we are going to teach the child how to ask. Speech and language is actually very important for most of the kids. Usually for kids or for our kids, we tend to give them everything. Okay, We tend to give them without really uh, waiting for them to actually ask because it becomes like automatic for us parents. Okay, you're going to eat. So this is the bowl, this is the food, everything is there. All they have to do is eat. So what you can actually do is set up a situation wherein they will be asking for the other items. So it, in a simple way, it just simply means that for them to be able to eat, they need a spoon. So you give them the bowl, you give them the plate with the food there, but there's no spoon. So they will be coming to you, they will be asking for it also. Or they can actually find it themselves. You can just say like, oh, you just go to the kitchen and get a spoon and a fork. Or you can ask, uh, let's say you can ask auntie for the spoon and the fork, you know. So again, it's following instructions. Plus teaching them functional communication also, okay? Because that's what they're going to need, okay? It's simple requesting. It's simple requesting, but you can always apply it on a daily basis because most of the kids anyway, they will be asking for things, okay? Uh, we don't teach them to just ask for things that they like. I want cookie. I want biscuit, you know? You can always set up asking for other things, if, let's say, for example, they're going to take a bath, you can, or after they have taken a bath, you can give them the pants, the shorts, you know, and if they need to have the underwear, you can just ask them like, oh, you know, I need the underwear. Or if you need the underwear, you can ask mama, you can ask mommy. Same thing, let's say, if um, they're going to use the toilet, we do that also. If we need to use a the toilet, there's no tissue. Although for us, if we know where it is placed, then we just get it. But most of the kids, if they, they know where they, they, they need to get it, then they need to ask. Like, I need, I need tissue. There's no more tissue. So you can actually teach that. Although the simple or the simplest way on how we can teach that is when we do some arts and crafts with kids, we ask them to do writing, cutting, coloring, all those things, okay? Most of the kids, those are the things that they can do independently. So we can always set it up for them. You can give them the paper, but there's no pencil. Or you can give them the paper with a shape. You ask them to cut, but, you know, they need to ask somebody for the scissors. So in that way, we can always incorporate, do they know how to ask for different items, not only for the same item? Because sometimes for kids, you show them the paper, automatically they will always ask for pencil. Even if you ask them, oh, you need to cut or you need to color. Okay? So they need to understand that also. So it, it requires for them understanding and also using the words in a more functional way. All right. Okay. So now we're going to see some uh, videos wherein there will be like different activities or different games that we can do at home.
Better, okay. Okay, Jay, sketch. Yeah. Okay, show. <laughs> Good job, Jay. Okay. okay, so in that first video, if you have like, you know, a basketball hoop, you have like a ball at home. I mean, it doesn't, if, if it's you have, or if you already have it at home, you might as well maximize the use of it. Okay? Like you can play games with a child. Aside from, you know, shooting the ball or throwing the ball on the hoop, what you can do is you can do catch and throw. You can play kicking the ball also. There's a lot of different activities that you can do. Although, of course, you might want to also check which activity the child likes, okay? Because if the child is motivated to do it, then the more that, you know, they will be more willing to do it if the motivation is actually too high, okay? Then we have another video. Okay, so now, okay. Very nice answer. Good job, then. Very nice, and that's one Good job, Titan. This new one. Let's try. Tap shoulders. Tap shoulders. Tap shoulders. Shoulders. There you go. Hi, Titan. Good. Let's try again. Tap shoulders. All right. So, in the second video, we are teaching basic following of instructions to our kids. So, so you make it like simple. You just sit in front of the kid. You do like very simple instructions like, you know, clapping hands, you know, tapping the table, you know, touching the shoulders, all those. Those are very simple. So what you can actually do with that is you can try it at home as well with your child. You can do it like, oh, giving a high five or let's say um, if you have also like some musical instruments at home, that's something that you can do also. So that at least a child will do it in a way where in, okay, if, you want, if they want to sing, then you can use the musical instruments to also um, uh, make them, you know, get interested with doing some other activities, okay? So these are just samples of the activities that you can do at home. Of course, what uh, we recommend is for you to somehow maximize, you know, you just have to gather, you just have maybe to look around, uh, look inside maybe your uh, stock rooms, you know, maybe you have like um, items there that you haven't used before that, you know, you might want to use it now, you know, so we, we you, you can actually do it, okay, and if you need like help also, you know, like uh, uh, ARN will actually help you, so you can ask, uh, the supervisors also, you can ask like uh, um, the therapist as well on what activities you can actually do. We can actually provide you with that because the most important thing is there will be consistency. It's maintaining the skills that we want to teach, okay, during this time, all right? Okay, no, so now for um, Sharon will talk about the tips, other tips, strategies, you know, on how you can teach your child, you know, like what, what you can do. Okay, what other things you can do and what techniques you can actually use while teaching them at home? Hi, good morning everyone. So thank you for attending our webinar. So basically, Harshita is able to uh, do the introduction and then Bell was able to discuss about the different activities that you can do with your kids at home. Now, the crucial part is, is how are we going to teach these skills to our kids? Okay, so I'm going to give you some tips on how to go uh, along with the activities at home. Okay, the first one is always, okay, first one is always remember to make it easy. Start with a simple and easy task. Then, of course, you have to model it with your child. And if you see that they're having difficulty, you will be there to guide them. Make sure that they will be successful at the start so that we can build the confidence and we keep on um, going the motivation, okay? So like for example, as was discussed with Harshita, you start with the daily routines because it's been happening every day, okay? Simple as during snack time or their meal time, bath time, waking up. So you don't need to have 
a very difficult task for them. Always start with easy tasks. The next one is always remember what's in it for him. If the activities you're thinking doesn't serve a purpose or there's no function, then definitely you're going to have difficulty working with your kids. So make sure you use a reinforcement to motivate your child to do things for you. He will work best if he do something, uh, it's something that they like or something fun for them. And then always, re always uh, consider the functionality of the activity. Like for example, if, you're, if you know that your child is having difficulty with imitation ta task, then of course you don't do that one first. Do something that they are successful of. Uh, most of the time, the thing that we, we need to start with are with their motivation. Like for example, they want to play with the toys or they want to eat snacks. So you can start first with um, requesting with the iPad, requesting for the car that they like or the train, or with the food itself that they like to eat at that moment. So start uh, with something that they like first, okay? The next one is always make your child communicate with you, okay? If um, uh, most of the time our kids doesn't uh, spontaneously request for things. So this one will happen if we create opportunities for the kids. So if everything is given to them, then of course they won't learn how to use their words uh, or even uh, different actions that they need you. So always make sure that there's an opportunity for them to communicate with you. That's very important. Okay, next one is you have to talk about it, especially when you're doing your um, activities, your schedule, always talk to your child, especially in setting up the routines because most of the time they want that uh, things that are ex uh, something expected for them to do, something that they need to follow, okay? Telling them about the changes, give them the security and comfort, and they also are prepared uh, what could take place. So make sure that you talk about the activities to them as well. Okay, the next one is, always think positive, okay? We all know that um, spending 24 seven with your child is quite challenging and it's difficult, but always make sure that you have this positive thought about what's happening. So uh, setting up the schedule can be difficult. So always remember these six steps, like stick with the schedule that you made for your child because most of our kids doesn't like uh, sudden changes. That's why it's important also to use your visual schedules uh, that can help them to uh, organize their uh, day, daily activities. Then you have to praise or reward your child for following the routines. And then be aware of your child's sensitivities, meaning if your child uh, are sensitive with noise or some texture or taste, you have to make sure that you are aware of those things. Okay, and then you have to create a safety zones at your home when your child can cope up with their unnecessary behavior. Like for example, we call it the meltdown. So make sure that we also know where do we handle our child if in the event they have these meltdowns. And then you also have to be consistent, meaning if it's a no, it's a no. Like for example, it's, it's bedtime already and it's not allowed uh, for them to play with the iPad or watch with the TV. So if the rule is you're not supposed to do it, then you have to be consistent that you won't give them the access to the iPad or the TV. Because the moment you are not consistent, then they will also be uh, thinking that, ah, okay, uh, in this way, I can do sometimes yes, sometimes no. So again, keyword there, we need to be consistent. Okay. And the last one is make it fun for your child. So as from the start, the, one of the tips is make it simple, make it fun as well, so that at least it will be a good experience with your child and with you as well. Okay, so yeah, so basically that's the presentation that we have for this morning. So now we are open for question and answer. And uh, earlier we received uh, questions already. Uh, and I think uh, Bell can help us uh, answer some questions. The, 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 the one that the participant was able to ask us. The first one. All right, so we have a question regarding uh, washing hands and brushing teeth, those simple activities. 
Uh, so the question is how will the child cooperate without running off, without squirming, without, you know, um, having all these negative behaviors, how to somehow force the child, okay? To wait, to listen, and to follow. Okay, the first thing is we are not, supposed to actually force the child okay if we are teaching a child how to cooperate with something okay uh, forcing them may not be it's not actually the best solution that we can do okay but then it also depends on the understanding of the child there are kids wherein they know how to do it it's just a matter of they just don't want okay so we need to analyze okay because this is a skill that we want to teach, but at the same time also, there's somehow a behavior involved, okay? Meaning, we want to teach a specific skill of washing hands and brushing teeth, but the reason why uh, the child is not doing it can be because they don't actually know how to do it yet, okay? Or they know, but they just don't want to follow. So let's say, for example, if we have a child if this is the first time that you want to teach the skill to the child, the steps of washing hands, how to brush teeth, the first thing is we need to desensitize them, okay? When we say desensitize, meaning we need to somehow prepare them. We need to make sure that they are actually okay, they are willing to actually do it first if you're just teaching the child. This is where the visual schedule will follow. If let's say you have a visual schedule wherein these are the steps for washing hands and the child will only need to do, let's say, step number one for now. The rest, you just have to guide the child. Then you can start in that way. Now, if the problem is the child doesn't really want, okay? They don't like maybe the feeling of getting wet. They don't like the sound of the toothbrush. They don't like the taste of the toothpaste, you know, things like that. So you need to desensitize first. Desensitize means if it's washing hands, you can try to do activities wherein, okay, there will be like you get a wet tissue maybe, or you can do some water play just for the child to get used to it. If it's like for brushing teeth, if it's the sound of the toothbrush, then maybe what you can do is try to like desensitize them in a way wherein you can play from the video, you can ask them to watch videos of uh, someone brushing teeth, you know, using the electrical brush, something like that. Or if, let's say, um, if it's the taste, then you can also like gradually do it in that way. Like, oh, okay, you just need to look at the toothpaste or maybe like put a little bit here. You need to start in a way wherein it will not be very um, negative for the child. Okay, so those are the things that you can actually do now there's another question also about um when do we uh present you know or if you're going to teach the child uh visual learning when do we present them okay do we present them do we present the activities one at a time okay yes you have to present them one at a time depending on the activity or the chore or the task that you want the child to do. You cannot teach all at the same time, especially if you see that the child have issues with both activities that you're teaching. If, let's say for example, if you're doing, if you want to teach washing hands and brushing teeth, and you know that in both activities, the child would not want to do it. They're not willing to do it. So you have to start with only one. You need to choose. Now, how do you choose? You have to choose in which activity the child would be more successful. Yes, all the negative behaviors will be there, but you have to check which one will have the lesser negative effect on them. Then you can actually follow doing the visuals. You can start with the simple um, telling them first what are the steps that they need to follow. It's just like that, okay? Just read the steps or use pictures, you know? for them to know that these are the steps on how you can actually wash your hands without really going immediately bringing the child to the bathroom and then doing it there. You can start first by just explaining to them, showing the pictures, 
letting the child you know get used to it and then gradually then you can move to like maybe going to the bathroom like having trips to the bathroom every once in a while you can actually do that also okay now there's a question um i think about uh following instructions so uh arshita can actually answer that one Hi, uh, Kaniki. I see that you've asked uh, if child follows instruction. Do you still recommend visual scheduling? Okay, so Kaniki, uh, as I think Bell also mentioned, and I also had talked a little about it uh, previously. So a visual schedule is nothing uh, but basically a visual representation of what to do next. Right. So this can be a visual schedule can be something about the whole day. So right when the child gets up, if the child has difficulty following instructions, um, you know, throughout the day, it gives them a sort of um, idea about what is going to come next. So a visual schedule for the whole day can look something like, OK, you get up, you brush your teeth, uh, then you can have breakfast, uh, then you need to do some work with uh, mommy and daddy and uh, then you can have time to play then you can have your lunch and so on so this is what a visual schedule for a day could look like then a visual schedule for uh, activities could look something like which i also showed uh, previously uh, something i'll maybe i'll just go over again to those slides one second Okay, so a visual schedule for uh, maybe what are the things that you need to do before you go to bed, right? Some kids might have difficulty going to bed right away. Like if you just tell them, okay, now it's time to sleep. They, it might not be uh, the best thing for them, right? They, may, they, may, they may, may not be ready to sleep right away. So maybe uh, an hour before bedtime, you can have a visual schedule which tells them what they need to do and how they need to prepare for the actual bedtime. So it tells them, okay, first you need to shower, then you have to wear your pajamas, then you can have your quiet time where you can do what you like, then you can you have to brush your teeth, then there's story time, and then eventually you have to sleep, right? So this is how it sort of prepares them for what is going to come next. Right. So same for other activities, say brushing teeth or if they have uh, difficulty eating their meals or washing their face or things like that. Right. So um, basically, if you're saying if your kid can already follow instruction, do I still recommend a visual schedule? Right. So a visual schedule is something which you can use regardless. Right. So. Um, even if the kid is following your instruction, a visual representation of what is going to come next is just going to ease him out. He's going to be better prepared of what's going to come next. There's going to be less anxiety. There'll be less chances of uh, any sort of uh, challenging behaviors. And uh, he'll be more likely to follow those instructions in the first place. Right. So you can try it out and see how it goes for your child. And then we can see. Um, okay, so ad any additional one, Harshita? Um, okay, uh, okay. Sharon, do you want to take a question? Yes, yeah. Uh, I'll be answering the question, how to correct my child without keep uh, without keep saying no or wrong? Okay, so basically saying no or wrong uh, doesn't really change the behavior. So uh, basically it's better for us to, if we see our child, like for example, kicking, instead of saying no kicking or stop that, that's wrong. Maybe it says, show me, be quiet or uh, uh, keep your feet to yourself. Or your, if, for example, your kids are throwing, pinching, instead of saying no hitting, no throwing, you say the positive one, which is, or the expected behavior, which is hands quiet. Okay, so most of the time, it's better for them to receive the positive way of how to correct the behavior than keep on uh, saying no or stop or wrong. That's wrong. Okay, 
And then there's one more question. I don't know if this is the follow up. So how to correct my child? Uh, sorry, not if if kid does the wrong way, how to deal with that one? So uh, again, when we're talking about behavior, we need to uh, consider the functions of the behavior, meaning. Uh, most of the behavior looks the same, but the reason why they're doing it are all different. To explain it further, most of the kid cries, okay, but there are different reasons why they are crying. They might be crying because they want to get an item or they want to get your attention, meaning they want mama or papa to stay with them, or maybe they are in pain, that's why they're also crying, or... Uh, they're also crying because of they might be having this what we call the self stimulatory behavior or they're feeling something inside them that they cannot express. So the way we deal with behavior is more of the function. So we cannot give you exactly the formula to handle the behavior because we need to study first why are they doing it on the first place. Okay, I hope I was able to answer those two questions. Uh, if you have more questions, please type in your question. All right. All right. So um, there's one more question. Um, the question is, there are times that the child can be fixated on a certain routine. So how do we get them to stop doing a routine to avoid a necessary behavior that it actually costs? Okay. So basically, if of course, we all have our own set of routines to follow, okay? And, and it's, it becomes like a, an easy way for us to go on during the day if we actually set those routines for us. Like from the time we wake up um, until the end of the day, this is what we actually do. So it somehow is very useful, okay, for most of us, okay? But of course, for uh, kids with developmental delays, developing these routines actually help them. It's just that we need to make sure that these routines will not, they will not depend too much on these routines. Meaning, if you actually try to change the routines, they will react negatively to it because for them, I need to do it in a very specific way all the time. Okay? Now, how do we, the question is, how do we stop them doing the routine? Stopping the routine is not actually the, 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 you know, the issue there, okay? It's not that you want to stop the routine. It's more of like you want to create new routines for the child with different activities so that they will not stick to doing the same routine with the same activity. Example, if let's say... Um, the routine of, let's say, when you go to the playground, okay? When you go to the playground, you always pass by, you know, this specific way or you always go on the right, you know, right side or you only you always go to this particular playground. Of course, the child would somehow get the routine that, okay, this is the playground that I always want to go to. But then what if, let's say, the playground is under construction? Okay, but you have another playground that you can go to and then the child wouldn't want to go there or the child would insist on going to the one where he's not supposed to go. So what can you actually do? Okay, you're not going to somehow tell them that, oh, you know, you need to keep on like, uh, uh, you, you cannot go there. It's not that you cannot go there. Yes, you cannot at that time because it's under construction. But what you want to teach the child, there are other playgrounds that we can go. So you can, as early as possible, you need to actually teach the child that when you create these certain routines to them, these routines can always change also. And you need to be the one to change it. Don't set a specific time when they will watch the iPad or you will be giving them the iPad at this particular time. Or uh, they only get to, let's say, um, they get to eat the cookie after they have lunch. What if you don't have the cookie? So those are specific routines. So what I'm saying is, if you want to give them, maybe you can give them one piece before lunch. Or maybe you can give them like one hour after, two hours after. So the idea is, 
not to create very, very specific routines to them. You can change. It's still a routine anyway, but you can just keep on changing. Okay? That's the idea there. Okay, let's see what else do we have here. Okay. Okay, there's another one that says like, my child doesn't like to do any activities. I need to force him every time. So I think it's something similar to what I explained wherein you need to check first why the child doesn't like to do the activity. Why the child doesn't like this particular activity. Because if you're saying that any activity, meaning whatever you ask the child, the child doesn't want to do, then that means the child is not motivated to do anything. If, let's say, um, you're going to ask the child to do something where, in fact, what am I going to get after doing that? If I don't get anything, you will not be motivated. If you are asked to come to work and you don't get paid, you're not going to be motivated to go to work. So it's as simple as that. Okay? Of course, for the kids that we have, we always like set up like rewards for them to motivate them. Of course, the rewards doesn't have to be, um, it's not a lifetime thing that, you know, all their life they will be getting the, the, the rewards. But it's a good way on, you know, motivating them wherein this is what you can actually do. Okay? So just to share, you know, I have one client that I uh, just uh, talked to yesterday. So the mom is saying that um, every time I ask the child to, to come with me to the supermarket, he doesn't want. Because... I mean, I mean, he refuses to. So I said, of course, because that activity is something like, what if I'm the child, what am I going to benefit from that? You can actually go to the supermarket. Hello, why do you have to bring me? But of course, the reason of the mom is, oh, because no one will look after him at home, so I need to bring him, okay? So I said, like, what you can actually do is maybe, you know, you can get a list, you can take a picture you can take a photo of what you need to buy in the supermarket and then maybe next time you ask the child oh you need to buy you know these two items and then you can buy let's say chips you know that he likes and it will be a reward okay for going with her plus the fact that helping her in that way you're teaching the child also to like know what items okay so it's more of like teaching vocabularies teaching language also because if you tell the child this is the specific brand that we want the child will look for it okay in what aisle you can actually find it or let's say oh we need milk and then he's already there how many um let's say um boxes of milk do we need okay how many pieces of chips you know how many packs of chips do we do we need so you can incorporate the skill also and in that way, the child will be motivated to go with you. Yes, you ask them to do something, but let's say when you reach home, he gets the chips, he gets the lace, and then he gets to eat it, okay? So those are just examples on what you can, how you can set up. Make it, make it fun for them. Uh, don't make it like a task that, or a demand that they need to do, okay? That, that they will have to do with whether they like it or not okay of course there are things that you know later on you want them to do regardless whether they get a reward or not but if you're having difficulty at the start it's always better to use rewards to them so that you can actually motivate them okay any reward is fine it can be activity it can be item it can be anything all right okay any other questions let's see I can answer the question about the sleeping uh, problem. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, basically, if your uh, child is having difficulty with uh, sleeping patterns, so there are different factors you need to consider. Okay. So, make sure it's something that you have to be part of the routine. So, if he's used to of sleeping 10 to 4, at uh, 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., slowly or gradually, you have to change it into a more appropriate uh, sleeping, uh, the, the timing of the sleep of the kids, okay? So how to do that one, things that you can consider is, of course, before bedtime, if you know it's uh, on the latter part of the day, avoid giving him uh, too much sugar 
or um, like food that makes the energy, you know, last for until late at night. So slowly, you you give it uh, early on the home, on the day, but not towards the end of the day. And then at the same time, you can do some uh, gross motor activities towards the afternoon, so that at least the child's uh, body will be more in a uh, well. I mean, he's more tired. And then uh, after the night routine, after shower, you can also give uh, some massage to make the child relax. And then you will uh, incorporate those as uh, what you call this bedtime for like a routine wherein you will start uh, playing uh, soft music or uh, you will start uh, turning off the light so that at least it will signal that the child needs to start uh, sleeping at, at uh, the time that you, uh, what you call this, uh, scheduled, okay? And then, of course, it will not happen over time. So it's uh, something that you need to practice. And then it will also be helpful that uh, before bedtime, make sure to bring your child to the, to the toilet so that at least um, to avoid him being wet also at night. So those are simple tips to help your child to be able to have a proper sleep. Okay, I hope I was able to answer your question. Okay, and then there's another question here um, about um, what you call this, how a uh, suggestion on how long should be an online session with a child would be especially for kids who have attention span, okay? So basically, uh, it, uh, the online session, it really depends on each kid, okay? So for example, if your child is having a short attention span, it's, uh, it's, not, it's nothing to do about uh, doing it uh, online or doing it, uh, uh, what you call this, one-to-one -one with the kid, okay? But because of what's happening now, we look into consideration of the online, right? So uh, it, the, 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 eye, uh, the short attention span should be worked on itself, okay? So of course, if child, uh, you need to build on those uh, skills. How to do it? Of course, you have to present activities that will help the child to increase their attention span. Uh, what are those activities? Uh, I know one of our posts in our um, uh, website or in our Facebook page uh, teaches uh, some steps on how to increase attention span. But like as, as a summary, of course, you need to make sure that you give an activity that is something that the child wants, and then you build on activities that will involve a lot of um, scanning skill as well, uh, like the puzzle, those shape sorters, and matching activities will be helpful also in increasing in increasing the attention span. Okay, so again, uh, this one is something that you need to work on uh, with the one working with the child at home. So maybe for now, ideally, it will be an hour of online session, but again, if the attention span is longer, then you can also increase your online session, okay? So uh, by the way, if you need more, uh, what you call this information about our center, uh, we will be flashing the, okay, it's, it's on the screen already on how you're going to contact us via email, our phone number, our Facebook account as well, okay? So yeah, so more questions? Uh, Harshita and Bell, any other questions that you would like to answer? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, okay, so I can see that Karthik has asked a question. Could you give us some tips to make our child uh, sit in one place and do activities? Uh, sitting tolerance is very low. How to increase it? Okay, so hi Karthik. Thank you for the question. So um, you're talking about sitting tolerance, right? So first, I think... Uh, just try to figure out what it, what it is that your child really likes. Try to figure that out first and then uh, maybe present those items where the child needs to be sitting, right? So there needs to be, as Sharon also mentioned previously, there needs to be something in it for the child. So what is in it for the child to actually sit down, right? So put some activities, put some games, put some toys that the child likes in the place where 
you would like them to sit so make so what you're actually also doing is you are making the child have a sort of positive a non aversive non threatening association with sitting down so the child will eventually understand it okay once i sit down i get something i like right so initially just do that then slowly and steadily you can do something which is called shaping right so shaping is basically you are very slowly and steadily increasing the sitting duration so you can start with as low as say 2 or 3 seconds right so okay let the child sit for 2 or 3 seconds engage in something they like and then you can just let them go okay so once uh, suppose they are doing their own thing you can say okay now it's going to be my turn so you call them back again then again make them sit for a few seconds then let them go so once you are sure that okay now my child is able to sit for say 3 or 4 seconds slowly and steadily increase the duration to say 7 uh, or 8 seconds right so and then once he's able to sit for those 7 to 8 or 10 seconds for some amount of time you've seen it happen a few times you let them go then you come back uh and then you can slowly and steadily just as i mentioned increase the duration move on from 5 seconds to 10 seconds like that to 20 30 1 minute 1 and a half minutes 2 minutes and that's how you will eventually see that your kid is now able to sit for a much much longer duration at the same time just make sure that the child uh, doesn't find it very aversive when um, he's being asked to sit right so when you're asked to sit make it such that the child also is able to engage in some activities that he likes so that he has that positive association and that positive uh, feeling about actually sitting down so with this kind of shaping of slowly slowly increasing the duration that is how you can try to increase and better the sitting behavior of the child okay uh any more questions okay bell sharon would you like to answer can you see any other questions All right there's a uh, one question here um saying that oh my child asks for things with actions like pointing um he doesn't communicate verbally how do we help him to communicate with us okay um this is one thing that um actually um ARN is a as part of the service that we provide for the child okay um because of course there are kids who can actually say what they want but there are kids also who doesn't have the capacity to actually use the language for now okay so how do we teach the child to ask for things if they cannot actually use their words okay so usually for kids initially what we do is we teach them how to use sign language okay now um the sign language that we teach is very very basic signs okay for items or activities that they want but the difference is we always pair it with the words meaning we don't just teach them how to sign and then that's it we always like encourage them okay to use the words now if they're not using the words yet then we will actually provide it for them so let's say for example if they want food they want to eat something we teach them how to sign that okay if you want something to eat this is the sign okay this means eat okay now when we teach them definitely if you teach the child how to do this the child will just copy without saying anything no words nothing okay but if we are the one teaching them we will be the one to provide the word for them So if I'm teaching the child then I would say like oh you want to eat let's say I hold something okay a food you want to eat then I will say eat okay and to teach the child first you get the the hand of the child and then you actually do it okay but then you provide eat eat you know but then you also need to encourage the child to produce the sound okay and that's where we can teach separately uh if the child is able to form the lips to pro- to to uh, um i mean to make the sound e you know so that's something that you can actually try to do now if let's say there will be other things okay like let's say they want to play okay so we can teach them you know like okay this is play you know something like that so you need to encourage them to communicate in a way that would be easier for them 
yes, speaking is very, very important because once they, they can actually talk, they can ask for anything that they want. Doing the sign language means you need to learn it also. Or everyone who's working with a child, everyone who is engaging with a child need to know exactly the sign. Because you don't want the child to get confused. If the child is communicating with you by doing the signs and you don't know, then you know the communication will stop as well. Okay, so you can teach basic signs, but always incorporate it with words. That's how you're going to teach that. Okay, all right. So I hope it helps. Like for for kids, for those parents whose kids are not really like talking, or they only have the initial stages of um, like having the speech, they can only say like some sounds. Another question that we have is. When we greet my son good morning or good night, he would usually give a roll call on everyone he knows even if they are not in the room with him. So how do we change this behavior? Okay. All right. So if you look at it, greeting, you know, other piece or other person, let's say in the morning, is actually a good thing, right? Um, the only problem here is if he keeps on saying the same thing every day. Can you imagine if you ask, if you say your child, good morning, and then he will say like, good morning, mama, good morning, papa, good morning, this, good morning, I mean, every day, okay? So what you can actually do is you try to divert the child's attention to saying something, okay? Like, let's say, for example, why don't you try not greeting him yet, okay? If somehow you greeting the child would actually trigger for the child to greet and then, you know, do a roll call of everyone. Then maybe you can start with something like instead of saying good morning, like, oh, okay, you give the instruction. Okay, come on, let's get up or let's go to the bathroom first. Try to somehow change because again, this has become a routine, okay? Every morning, mommy will say this or daddy will say this. This is what they always say every time I wake up. And this is the answer that I give. So if the next day they give the same answer, the same question, I will give the same answer. And then next day, same question from them, I give the same answer. And then we realize that, oh, they're giving the same answer all the time. Maybe what we need to do is try to change the question also. Because if you give the same, uh, the same question to the child, definitely, and if they learn how to give a specific answer to that, you don't expect them that if you give a different question, they will give a different answer unless you teach them. So you can actually try asking them a different thing. Maybe don't greet them yet or maybe instead of greeting them, maybe you give the instruction, oh, say good morning to mamas or say good morning to papa. So it becomes like an instruction that they need to follow after. All right? Okay, so I hope uh, I was able to answer that question. Uh, okay, I would just like to mention here one thing. Uh, Dr. James Partington, he's having a webinar. We are doing a webinar with him uh, next week, which is on 16th May. So he's going to basically be talking about uh, how we can use the, how we can maximize the use of existing skills in the children during this pandemic. So uh, Dr. Partington is one of, he's one of the pioneers in our field of behavior analysis and he's been working in this field uh, for over 40 years. So do tune in and do watch that webinar for sure. Um, okay, there's another question that I would like to take. Uh, it's about how about if your kid always asking the same question even though he knows the answer. He still wants to get that answer from you. I think here, uh, I think you yourself have mentioned a little bit of the answer. You are saying that he wants to get that answer from you, right? So it seems like this thing, uh, this thing is a little bit of a behavior that the child has developed maybe over a period of time. Um, so here, what you can actually think about is the behavior, right? So the behavior is your kid asking the same question again and again. 
even though he knows the answer. So here it looks like he's, he probably is trying to get attention from you. If, if he knows the answer, then the reason could be just that he's just trying to get attention from you. So one thing you can definitely do is um, the next time he asks you the question, maybe you answer it once. Rest of the times, over some period of time, whenever he's asking you that question, just ignore it. Initially, you might see that uh, he's still repeating the question. That's just because he's in the routine of it. He's just used to doing it. But over a period of time, when he does not get that response from you, more likely that, that asking behavior of the same question and again and again will go down. Another thing you can also do is, um, if you see that uh, the child is engaging in this behavior of asking the same question again and again, is, is he, if he's trying to get attention from you, there's other ways you can teach him to get that attention, right? So ask him that, you know, ask him, do you need something? Or make him request, okay, like, excuse me, or can I talk to you? Maybe he's trying to get attention in a way that he understands. So teach him other ways to request for attention. So maybe that could be a way to go. Um, another thing, uh, anybody else? Sharon Bell, would you like to take any questions? Yeah, I think, uh, okay. One question also is about, uh, what do you call this? He never focus. He never focus on particular thing while teaching him, and he runs away of the situation and doesn't understand the instruction we give him, how to handle it. Okay, so again, it's about behavior. So basically, the kid is always trying to escape. So I think kids are smart enough to know if it's work time. So if they see the materials in the table or if they see the teacher is coming, that's the time they're going to do their own thing. Okay, how to deal with that one? Uh, as what mentioned about... Um, a while ago about tips on how to teach kids, right? So we need to be consistent. So for example, if it's really working time, make sure to help them to, to go back to the seat. And then if they run away again, get them, okay. Avoid uh, having your voice uh, going up or I mean escalating. Like for example, you keep on calling your child, Brian, Brian, Brian. You don't uh, put uh, you, you make sure that you won't be on the stage wherein you're at the peak of your, um, what you call this, of your voice as well, because sometimes it won't help. So the moment you call them, if they're not following, get them so that they understand. Once you call them, they need to follow. So from there, you have to build on the instruction from, from him, okay? So I think we're almost running out of time. Uh, I think some of the questions that we haven't answered, we can get back to you. And then as the page that shows you, if you have more questions, we are here to help you and guide you uh, with what's happening with the pandemic uh, as of the moment. So again, we are also uh, open for online sessions. So please do contact our centers. We have our number, our email address, our Facebook account. So um, yeah, so uh, Bell and Harshita, any more uh, closing remarks? All right, so um, ARN, okay, um, we are, we actually plan to um, do a series of uh, um, all these talks, you know, for the month of May. And hopefully even after the month of May, it's not only during the circuit breaker, you know, we want to help each of the parents, you know, on how we can actually guide you or assist you, you know, on, on uh, difficulties that you might be having at home, you know. Uh, so um, even if, you know, we would have, uh, like, we resume the sessions back in the center or at home, we would still, um, like, be willing to actually help you. So um, we would you know, like gladly like hear your feedback also on what are the topics that we can actually talk about next time, okay? Um, and it will be also some sort of um, la, um, like a way for us to know on what else we can do, how we can actually help you and, and what uh, uh, are the things that you can do at home with your child, okay? Or, or make, it, make your life simpler, okay? It's just like that. Like make your life simpler, especially during this time. So just like what Arshita said, um, 
We'll be doing it on consecutive Saturdays. So for next week, it will be uh, Dr. Partington. Okay? So we encourage uh, everyone to um, please register, you know, because it will be really very, very helpful for everyone. Okay? It will be really helpful. And um, of course, you know, even if we're not able to answer uh, all your questions, you know, you can still, um, we still have the time because we will having all these series. So you can, you know, still ask you know, those questions as well. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us and uh, hope it was helpful for all of you and hope you were able to answer uh, all your questions. And if you have any more questions, you have any feedback, please feel free to get in touch with us and we will try our best to help you guys.